The one question everyone seems to want to know in today's gospel story is, who is this Jesus? I think the implied question is, what kind of leader is he? We hear he's leading some people. We think, you know, he's stirring up some trouble. You know, uh, what kind of leader is he and is he going to be? Where is he going to take us and how is he going to lead us? I think this is an important question for us today as we ponder in our hearts what kind of leader do we want to be in the context where God has called and guided us as a family as parents and grandparents how do you want to lead your children and grandchildren and extended family as a manager how do you want to lead the people on your team as a student when it comes to doing a group project when it's your turn to step up how do you want to lead your fellow students as a volunteer, so on and so forth. How do we want to lead? Do we want to lead like the the powers of Jesus' day, the the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who really looked at power in terms of scarcity? They thought there was only so much power to go around. There's only so much wealth in the pie. And if someone comes and they take some of my power or some of my wealth, then I have less. And so anyone who rises up the ranks is a threat to me. That's a worldly way to lead. And many, many people have done that. And many, many people have found an empty road at the end of that uh, journey. But the other way to lead is to be a servant leader. To put your team's needs above your needs. To put your family's needs above your needs. To see your calling as a leader to serve others. A servant leader. It's a totally different way to lead. Instead of being selfish, you're selfless. That's the type of leader that God sent to the world in Jesus Christ. And not to make all these people upset, which it did. But here's, the, I think, the point of why God did made us, brought us a servant leader in Christ. Yeah, all the needs get met. Hopefully people don't fall through the cracks when you have servant leadership. That's true. But even more than that, I believe a servant leader inspires people to come to him or her. And Jesus certainly did that. And when a servant leader uh, teaches his or her subordinates to be servant leaders, that attracts people to an organization or a movement, right? So if you want to be a rousing company, be, not only be a servant leader yourself, but empower your, the people you work with to be servant leaders. Now here's what's going to blow you away and keep you up at night. It does me. If you're willing to courageously be a servant leader and to teach your team to be servant leaders, and to train them to train others to be servant leaders. Well, now you've got expansive growth. Now you've got a company that can't keep up with the demands. Now you've got a church that can't build a building fast enough because you're putting yourself out of a job, you see. Your servant leaders are creating more servant leaders, and that's attractive to everyone in the community. I think that's why one of the main reasons God sent us Christ a servant leader is that the kingdom of God would be expansive and would explode and would include everyone. And it's done just that for 2,000 years. So this morning I want to look at uh, three attributes of what makes a good servant leader. And hopefully you can apply that to your lives wherever God is calling you to lead. First of all, I believe a servant leader is generous. A servant leader is generous. A servant leader gives. Now, when a pastor says that, the first thing you think, oh, get out the wallet, you know, here it comes, right? Yeah, a servant leader is generous with their money, but also a servant leader gives of their time. A servant leader isn't offended when someone and their team interrupts them and says, hey, I need some feedback on this. You're willing to give your people the time they need to invest in them. People like working for someone who's generous. Now, I've had a long career before becoming a pastor, seven years in in broadcasting and some time in radio, part-time in a high V before that. And I, like you, have worked in places where they've both been kind of stingy leaders, power grabbers, and servant leaders. And let me tell you the difference between them. (laughs) A real-world example. My first job out of college was at a small television market in Kirksville, Ottumwa. You have to understand they rank the TV markets by how many people they can reach uh, using households using television, or HUT for short. So the number one market of households using television is New York City, no surprise. Number two is Los Angeles. Number three is Chicago. And on down the list, there's 210 broadcast markets. Anyone want to take a guess what number Kirksville Tumwa is? (laughs) 199. 
we've just got under the bar of 200. <laughs> but it was, it was god awful. It was terrible. We made $14,000 a year salary, no overtime. And I, we worked tons of overtime. And I had a boss who was just awful and yelled at us all day long and made life terrible. And our coworkers, we couldn't stand one another because we wanted to climb over each other to get the heck out of there. It was an awful work environment. None of the equipment worked. I had to shoot every interview twice. It was terrible. And I didn't really enjoy life. So some of you are in those jobs now. All right? And then I got into Market 136 into Columbia, Missouri, and then I got here to the lovely city of Cedar Rapids, which is Market 90 in the top 100, and oh, was life a lot better here. Not only was the pay better, but I worked for servant leaders who were generous, not only with their pay, paying us, but with their time. I had mentors here, loved my coworkers, all of them. We supported one another, we lifted one another, we tried to be servant leaders and serve each other. And it led us to the number one television station in the market. Like, there's, no, there's no coincidence there. Servant leaders attract other people. You can be generous, you can be stingy, but a servant leader, most of all, is generous. Secondly, a servant leader listens. A servant leader listens. Now, Jesus demonstrates all these things for us, doesn't he? If you go back to the first point, think about the power that Jesus had. Jesus was uh, fully human like us. He had a heartbeat and did all the things we do, felt all the emotions and difficulties we feel, but he also had all the power and authority of God. He healed this man that was blind. I don't know about you, but there's not a lot of people walking around today that can do that. But he did it. He had all this power and authority and he could have kept it for himself, making himself the most strong uh, human being ever to live, but he didn't. What flowed into him flowed out of him, right? What flowed into him with power and healing flowed out of him with power and healing. And he gave his team, the disciples, that same power. He created them to be servant leaders and they could go out and they could heal and they could be generous. Our God is a generous God. Secondly, a servant leader listens. A servant leader listens. Going through a Financial Peace University, which is a class to help people with their personal finances help lead that here at this church. Over 400 of you and people around the community went through that class, and I learned a valuable lesson I still use in my small groups today. This could work for you in your small group. When you're leading a small group, Dave Ramsey's team says that you should only do 10% of the talking. Now think about that. If you're in a small group situation, maybe at work, around the, the board meeting, if 10 comments are made, you get one of them which means you've got to shut up and listen to the other nine, right? What's that old adage, if God intended you to talk twice as much as you hear, he'd give you two mouths and one ear, right? So you should at least be listening twice as much as you talk, but even more, because that empowers your team. They're taking ownership of ideas as they should, and you don't comment on their comments, you let them work things out together. A servant leader listens, and part of that is it's taking feedback. As a good leader, I try to do this, and you should too, is to welcome feedback. Your door should always be open for people to come in because that will make you a better, stronger leader. When you hear they're honest, when someone's brave enough to give you honest feedback, you should humble yourself and listen to that. Now, I'm not talking about uh, tolerating some group email that goes out about you or, or you know, some word that's spoken in an open meeting. Now, that can be a passive-aggressive way to take down a leader and shouldn't be tolerated. But in private, when they come to you and your door should always be open, you should listen to that. A servant leader listens. Did Jesus listen? Did Jesus listen when the disciples said, Jesus, we don't have enough bread here. We don't have enough food. What are we going to do? Did Jesus listen when they're on the boat and they said, Jesus, there's a storm coming. We don't know how to handle this. They say, just shut up. I'm the leader. I'm in charge. <laughs> no. He quietly and patiently listened. To his team. And then he quietly and patiently spoke a reassuring word. It's going to be okay. God will provide for us. God will calm the storm. God is in control. A servant leader listens. Finally, a servant leader leads by example. Friends, if you're going to be a courageous leader in your places of work, in your places of family, you have to practice what you preach. You have to do the thing first. 
You have to be willing to go there and risk yourself and put yourself out there if you're going to call anyone to do the same thing for you. Now, does Jesus do this for us? Oh, you better believe it. He's the good shepherd, right? And what's the shepherd do? The shepherd leads the flock. The shepherd is in charge of their very lives. The shepherd has to be trustworthy and transparent. And Jesus is all these things is outlined in the beautiful words of Psalm 23, which you guys know so well. You know, it's funny, it's ironic. Psalm 23 has really become associated. It's like every funeral you go to, you hear Psalm 23, right? I, I do a lot of funerals. That's great. But it's not meant to be a funeral psalm. It's meant to be a psalm about life and how we live life. And we understand as followers, as Christians, as sheep, as believers of God, that the Lord is our shepherd. And I shall not want. Right? The shepherd's going to feed me and give everything I need. I, I can be a generous leader. I don't need more and more stuff to make me happy. You know, money will flow into you if you're a successful servant leader, and that's okay. Money's not a bad thing, but it's also going to flow out of you. It's going to flow in, it's going to flow out. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down beside still waters. He leads me to green pastures. I listen because he's worth listening to. He's a trusted leader, and he listens to me. A servant leader listens. And finally, we say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. The modern translation, uh, even though I walk through the darkest places, the darkest valleys, I will fear no evil because I know that my servant leader has already been there. I'm not going first as a follower. I'm not going alone. God goes with me. God goes before me. Even death. Even death. Jesus had all the power to to take himself off the cross or avoid all that pain or heal himself so that he wouldn't have to go through that. But he did that for you. For you. He not only died, but he was raised by God the Father. He was resurrected to new life. All those so he can say from the other side of death and eternal life, it's okay, come little sheep. <whistles> right? Come to your, come to your shepherds. It's all right. I'm leading by example. I'm here first. I will be with you every step of the way, no matter what challenge you have, because I believe in you. I'm your leader. I'm going to share the wealth. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to listen. I'm going to lead by example. Friends, that's a servant leader. And when we're baptized into these waters, we promise that we will serve like Jesus. So we should take this seriously. We should apply these lessons to our work and to our classrooms and to our families and to our lives. Amen? Amen? We should be generous people. Amen. We should listen. And we should lead by example. May God give you the power and the courage to do that wherever he has called you. Amen.